to you, Father, heads in prayer here. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, and thank you for bringing us all here today to worship you. Please help Pastor Dyes Ty as he gives the message today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Yeah, there's a new bag for you. Get it. And she'll get a name tag on it. Yeah. Rex will help you right there. We are talking about what discipleship might look like for you. 2021. Discipleship. Where are you? And, and, and how do you understand? And we're working through this, this thought process. It's not new to the majority of us. But it might be different today and this time. So we're going to spend some time working through that. And each week, we've been looking at a different aspect. Talked about being recruited. So the video talked about that. You know, Jesus was uh, kind of coming into his ministry. He was somewhere around 30 years old. That was about right for a Jewish man uh, who had gone through all the training to become an official teacher. Uh, there's one thing about Jesus, he did things the right way, and uh, so he didn't start his ministry till it would be appropriate to do so, uh, and he recruited disciples, people who would follow him. He called out men and women that were similar to us in the sense that they were just everyday people. So we talked about this recruitment process. We talked about um, the fact that Jesus did things by authority that the people were drawn to because he taught in a way that the other religious leaders did not teach. And there was this expectation that his disciples, those who followed him, would do the same thing. They would teach with this incredible authority, very different from the culture of the world. It's still happening today. And so we come to... A uh, couple today and next Sunday, we're going to be done with this. Not done, but I'm not going to preach on discipleship uh, necessarily as specifically anymore. But today, I want you to think about this concept. We really can't lose. If we put our hope and faith in Christ, we can't lose. And if we'll follow in obedience, we can't lose. That's primarily because it's on God's shoulders. It's on his ability to do things that we find our strength and our hope. And if there's one thing we know about God, his ways will not be thwarted. We just need to join. So uh, um, Carly read the scripture, Romans 8, 31. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? All right, so I got a lot for you. All right, I got, I got four sticky notes. We're going to start in Romans 8. So flip over there, starting in verse 18, and it's a little bit of a lengthy passage. So if somebody starts snoring, give them an elbow, tell them this is important, wake up. We're going to be in verse 18 starting there, and it's a, it's a lengthy passage. I'm not going to spend time on every verse. We're going to look at the incredible truth that Jesus has already provided us victory. We can't lose. Now, the other day... I read a short devotional from Greg Laurie. You may not know who Greg Laurie is. Uh, he's associated with Harvest America. He's a pastor out in California. And every year they do a, a huge revival uh, crusade type event. They telecast it around the world and churches can, can uh, be a part of that and show it on the big screen. And Anyways, Greg Laurie, he's, a, he's an evangelist. He tries to lead people to faith in Christ. And he wrote this real short devotional. And within it, he made these kind of significant points that I hadn't thought about. You know, sometimes when you're preparing a message, you feel like you got it all right there. And then you read something and you go, oh no, I left out a big portion. <laughs> Greg Laurie kind of convicted me this week of that. He said, you're leaving out something here, buddy. He said, victory is ours, but we have much to lose. Victory is ours, but we have much to lose. So I'm going to kind of develop that as we work through several passages today. Let's look at Romans 18, uh, 8. Starting in verse 18, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will, 
will be revealed to us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not have, yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. Now listen, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. That, that's a popular verse. Right? We use that a lot. And we talk about how if we're a Christ follower, or a believer in God, that even in the worst circumstances, God can work for the good of us. It may be hard to see. That's a popular verse. It's, contextually, it makes a lot of sense as we read those verses around it. Let's continue. Verse 29, For those God foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those He predestined, He also called. And those He called, He also justified. Those He justified, He also glorified. There's a lot of doctrinal disputes here in these several verses about predestination and the elect and some of these things that run through all the denominations. And I'm not going to cover it today. <laughs> so go look it up on your own. Uh, I've got a certain way that I perceive it and believe it. There are others who would disagree with me. Um, I'm not going to cover it today. Uh, we're going to look at our victory in Christ because of God's goodness and his sovereignty and that he foreknows all that's going to happen. I can, I can trust in that. I can put my faith that he knows. That he is sovereign over it. And that he brings victory through his son's life, death, and resurrection. So we jump to verse 31. Do you got a little subtitle there? I do. It says, more than conquerors. I, I got to go off the track just for a second. Bear with me. I'm kind of a sports guy, as you know. And winning is sort of important if you're a sports guy. A big game today. Can't say the um, Super Bowl of fun because that's trademarked. Big game today. And they're going to try to win. If they're not trying to win, I mean, why are they playing? And there's kind of a um, perspective that's going around across America in particular that we shouldn't make everything about winning. And there's some truth to that, right? We shouldn't cheat to win. We shouldn't uh, sacrifice our, our moral and our ethical uh, integrity in order to win. But listen, folks, the Bible is talking about winning. Victory in Jesus we sing the song. It's important that our efforts, we talked about it a couple of Sundays ago, discipleship requires effort. It's important that we are putting the effort forth. Now the victory is ours because of Christ. We're going to develop that even more. But we have much to lose if we don't give our time, our efforts, and our efforts. Uh-oh, Mike. It was me, huh? It starts to slide. It doesn't fit my ear. I got little ears. Now you're going to be looking at my ears the whole time. <laughs> but they are. They're little. This thing doesn't fit. If, if you want to blame somebody, blame Mike Wright. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> blame me for everything else. Verse 31. What then shall we say in response to these things? As God is for us, who can be against us? Verse 32. He who did not spare his own son, you need to read that again. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for all of us. How will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died. More than that, who was raised to life is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. 
Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Verse 38, another um, popular couple of verses, 38 and 39. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Victory is found in Christ. We can't lose, but we have much to lose. The second king of Israel, go back to the Old Testament, the second king of Israel, David, the shepherd king, the little boy who went to the battle and, and by faith fought Goliath the giant. The second king of Israel, David. He is known for an incredible faith in God. This youngster, maybe under the age of 12, likely under the age of 12. He's sent to the front lines to bring some nourishment, some, some uh, snacks to his brother who's, who are fighting with the um, army against the Philistines. And he asks the questions that every little kid asks, what's going on? Well, how's it going? How's the fight going? How's the battle going? And they tell him, shut up, get out of the way. He finds out that the Philistines have this champion, this giant um, Goliath. And he... He says, I'll take him on, one-on-one -on -one combat. So I'm, I'm uh, paraphrasing, obviously. The youngster, he has, he's armed with virtually nothing, no armor, no sword, no helmet. Yet he has a plan to defeat the giant Philistine. He has a plan. He does have one weapon. You, you know it's a slingshot. He's got some, some stones, and he's going to rely on God for the victory. He's going he's gonna to say, um, God's going to do what he has done before for me. I want to I read it a little bit. 1 Samuel, you don't have to turn there unless you just really want to. 1 Samuel chapter 17. We're going to pick up in the middle of the story here of David and his fight against Goliath. You're familiar with this story. This is not a story you don't know. But I want to read it specifically so you hear some of the details. Verse 32, it says, David said to Saul, Saul's the king, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. David's maybe 12 years old. He tells the king, <laughs> he's a bold little boy, <laughs> uh, don't worry, King Saul, I'll go fight him. Verse 33, Saul replied, you are not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a young man, and he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. A lion or a bear out in the fields would attack the sheep, and David would rescue his sheep from the beast. Verse 36, your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. The uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them. Listen, because he has defied the armies of the living God. Verse 37, the Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. Where does confidence to fight battles come from? Well, it comes from our past experiences of victory. Success. I've done it before. This may be a little different circumstances, but I've, I've fought the lion or the bear or I've overcome obstacles in the past and I'll do it again. Yet David's faith is not so much in himself, but rather in the Lord. His confidence is what has God has done on his, for his benefit in the past. That's important to note. His confidence comes from God. So we read Romans chapter 8. It said, what then shall we say? 
if God is for us, who can be against us? <laughs> but we don't always put a period on that statement, do we? <laughs> we say, well, if God is for us, who can be against us? And then we start seeing the giants, whatever they are, and we start going, oh, woe is me. How are we going to overcome this? And Man, hard, and I just don't know, and we lose faith. Well, we're in good company. It happened to lots of individuals in Scripture. It happens to uh, some of our most mature in our church. They've experienced similar times of doubt, confusion, um, unfaith. David is a great example here in the Bible of someone who says, the Lord will grant me victory. So I want, I want to repeat, we can't lose, not because of what we've accomplished, but because what God has done through Jesus for us, for our benefit. You need to go back to Romans chapter 8, read it again, and just continually read it until you get it, and it's in your heart, and you believe it, and you're not going to doubt and fear anymore, because we can't lose. We cannot lose. A little bit later in, in Scripture, the Apostle Paul is going to say, whether I live or I die, I'm not going to worry about it. To live is Christ, to die is gain. Fear and doubts and confusion no longer are going to govern my decision making, but rather confidence in the Lord will guide me. David said it. He's a young man. There's something to be said about kind of that um, naivety. No, na naivety. Is that how you say being naive and plural? Uh, being naive, right? Not knowing. That's how you say it. The fellow with the guitar, not the accompaniment. Uh, that guy. Being naive. There's something to be said about just not knowing all the troubles and all the things and all the failures that exist out there. David, obviously, he didn't know a whole lot of failure in his life. So he was confident in this next situation. Boy, we can dwell on our failures, can't we? We can sure make our failures loom large in our lives. And that's what we remember. Not God's faithfulness to bring us through. We focus on the wrong things. Not so with David. The young David does kill Goliath. And as he goes out to meet him, listen to what he says. I'll, I'll pick it back up in verse 41. Meanwhile, the Philistine, with his shield bearer in front of him, kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was little more than a boy, glowing with health and handsome, and he despised him. He said to David, am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands. Listen to him, and I, I'll strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I will give the carcass of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. <laughs> I, I get chill bumps. I, I want to be like that kid. Who comes at us, defies the armies of God? Now, this is the Old Testament. So transition to the New Testament. Who are the armies of God today? It is the church. And we cannot lose. We can be unfaithful. We can be disobedient. We can be apathetic. But we can't lose. I'm playing pool with my son yesterday. I said, son, my team is either going to win or my team's going to lose, but we're not going to be beat. Because I kept knocking in the eight ball. And then I would knock in the white ball and the eight ball. But they never beat us. I either beat myself or we beat them. We're either going to win or we're going to lose. You say, well, obviously, but we're not going to be beat. God's church is not going to be beat. Whether we join or not, <laughs> we don't have to be a part of it. We don't have to be on the front line. We don't have to work at it. We can sit back and let somebody else enjoy the fight. We can take on the attitude that 
Well, everybody's a winner. And we make too much out of competition. And certainly we do when it's secular purposes. But when it comes to the thing of God, winning matters. And the church can't lose. We can do a lot of things, but we can't lose. We can't be beat. David's confidence was in the Lord. The victory was the Lord's over the enemy. And it was already a foregone conclusion. God Almighty will not be thwarted. Now, the greatest enemy of mankind has been identified as death. It seems so final. But see, Christ has already conquered death. Our enemy, our greatest enemy, has already been um, slain. Now, I want to transition just a little bit more. Stick with me. I still got three more um, sticky notes. There's more to the story of David. The young man David becomes a hero because of his uh, great bravery and his confidence in the Lord, and he kills Goliath. And from that day forward, he's set on a trajectory to become the king of Israel. Really before that day, but, but now it's public. Everybody knows he's a rising star. And the king of the day, King Saul, becomes jealous and envious of the young David. And he spends at least the next 10 plus years trying to kill David. Now, back to Greg Laurie and his devotion, he said something that struck me. He said, when we begin to place our faith in Christ and we begin to fight the good fight that Paul talks about in the rest of the New Testament, we're going to make enemies. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna find people who oppose us. Let me assure you, I don't think Jim Towns is here today, but let me assure you, every time Jim wants to bring up faith here in local government in Santa Fe, there are a number of people who see him as the enemy. They would like nothing more than to shut him up. Now, God bless Jim. He's fighting the good fight in politics. I don't know how he does it. But if we begin to bring spiritual truths into our communities, into our schools, into our civic organizations, there will be people who want you to be quiet. Now, that, we could go into that. I'm not going to go into what sin does and how it creates this confusion and anger. And, and until people are humble enough to receive truth, they're going to be angry at, at anybody who convicts them. But the truth remains that David made an enemy that day when he killed Goliath. He made an enemy of the king. Isn't that interesting? That the guy on his side, he becomes his enemy. Saul is going to literally go insane trying to kill David, literally insane. He's going to be out of his gourd trying to kill David out of fear that David's going to take his place in his kingdom, out of jealousy and envy because David shows faith in the Lord. You can know that if you join the effort to be a genuine disciple of Christ, you will make enemies. If you're like me and you don't like confrontation, I don't like confrontation. I don't like people to not like me. So I struggle sometimes to speak truth because I don't want to make enemies. That's unfortunate. So that's a part of my sin nature that God is still um, working out when I release it. The truth is we'll make enemies. I want to share with you three things, and we're going to look at some additional scripture with them. Number one, when it comes to trusting the Lord to bring victory in our lives, there's one thing we can know for sure, without doubt, without fear, without any suspicion. Death no longer is to be feared for the Christ follower. So just... Uh, 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 if that's an issue for you, death is no longer to be feared. Romans chapter 6, verse 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Death is not to be feared. Do you remember um, the Judds, country music stars, uh, mom and daughter um, singers, Judds? Yeah, they're pretty good. I like the Judds. Listen to the song they sang. You'll recognize it. These are the lyrics. I know where I'm going. Don't you want to come too? I got my reservations, and I got one for you. The train's leaving just after dark. There's always room for a, another heart. I know where I'm going. Don't you want to come too? I know my destination. It's awaiting for you. I got no hesitation. That's where I want to be. And by the time the sun comes up, I'll be drinking from a loving cup. I know where I'm going. Don't you want to come too? Don't you want to come? Don't you want to ride? Don't you want to be there by my side, hand in hand, holding on to the sweet salvation 
that's waiting for me and you. Yeah, can you hear the, can you hear the tune? <laughs> I was going to sing it, but yeah, my voice. And, and yeah. <laughs> There's another verse that talks about singing. And the, re- the bell's ringing and letting the Spirit move you. That was a pretty popular country song. It was talking about um, making sure your reservation is set for your eternal life. Greg Laurie says, we can't lose, the victory is ours, but we have much to lose. So point one is we, we shouldn't fear death, it's been conquered, the victory is ours. So just let it go. Point two is until we pass from this earth, if we align ourselves with Jesus, and we really do take our discipleship seriously and we join the fight, and it's our aim and our goal to win Again, referring to the Apostle Paul, he says, I don't just, I don't just box the air, I don't just uh, uh, train for no reason, but I'm training for the race. I want to I wanna win the race. Winning is, it matters. Until, if, we, if we align ourselves with Jesus and we commit to this type of discipleship, the second point is we're going to find enemies. 1 John um, chapter 3, you don't have to turn there uh, if you want to. Do whatever you want. What do you, what do you want? 1 John chapter 3, verse 11. For this is the message you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if the world... Hates you. You, you. you may not be real familiar with Cain and Abel. Uh, going way back into the Genesis narrative. Adam and Eve's sons. And the first murder. Uh, uh, ever recorded murder. Two brothers. I believe it. I had two brothers. Murder crossed my mind occasionally. <laughs> Time to just um, admit our sin this morning. Cain kills his brother because he's jealous, he's envious, because God looked at Abel's sacrifice and he favored Abel's sacrifice over Cain's. We could go back and read and figure out why God looked upon Abel's sacrifice more favorably than he did Cain's, but God gives Cain an opportunity to repent. God gives Cain an opportunity to understand, and Cain struggles. When we begin to act and live out our faith, We will have enemies. 1 John says, don't be surprised when the world hates you. I just don't, I don't want the world to hate me. So I'll compromise. I'll be honest. Uh, I just won't always speak truth. That's unfortunate. I'm the pastor. You guys help me because I struggle. I don't want the world to hate me. Friendship with the world is very attractive. I get sucked into it. I don't like enemies. Evil will always find a way to try to kill righteousness. He says, don't be surprised. This is the elder John, another of Jesus' disciples speaking there in 1 John. Let's make one more point here. We have victory over death, our greatest enemy, because what Christ has already done. As we align ourselves with Christ, we will find enemies in this world. Point three, even though we've already won the forever battle, Victory over death and eternity is ours. While we're still here, there's much to lose if we don't get in the fight. And part of our uh, emphasis on discipleship is exactly for this purpose. There's an urgency in our homes, in our community, on our, on our little kids' baseball teams. There's an urgency because we have much to lose if we are unfaithful to proclaim the victory found in Christ. The world is falling apart. Daily, we hear examples of the fulfillment of some of the worst end-time prophecies we can ever read in Scripture. 2 Timothy chapter 3, you, you, you'll remember these verses as I begin to read them. I marked it because I'm not very fast getting to them. Go, Ben, go. 
He's flipping. Second Timothy chapter 3, first five verses. But mark this. There will be terrible times in the last days. Listen. <laughs> People will be lovers of themselves. I, I, I can't help but get drawn into politics sometimes. I listened to a podcast uh, some months ago about Black Lives Matter. Their whole foundation of this organization, whether you're for it or against it, I'm not going to get into that. But the whole foundation of their organization is they were unpleased, displeased with the court's ruling of the Trayvon Martin case. They disagreed with the ruling of the court, and therefore they launched their organization. It was about what they thought was best for them. It had nothing to do with justice, had nothing to do with righteousness, had everything to do with I want it to be the way I want it to be. Lovers of themselves. I don't know everybody in that organization. It might be a good organization. I'm not getting into that. I just know the foundations of it was based on displeasure with the rulings of the courts because they didn't rule in their favor. It didn't go the way they wanted it to go. Lovers of themselves. Lovers of money. Ooh. In the last days, it says there will be terrible times. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents. That's not just children. That's us adults dealing with our aging parents. Pop, you're not that old yet, so it's all right. You'll be okay. A few more years and I'll start dealing with you, pal. <laughs> right? That's how it works disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. Paul tells the young Timothy have nothing to do with such people. Friendship with the world is enmity with God. There will be terrible times in the last days. Prophecy here, as Paul, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, tells the young Timothy a, a form of discipleship, training him to be a pastor. He says these last days are going to be recognizable by this list of ungodliness. As every year passes, we see more and more evidence of 2 Timothy chapter 3. But we have victory over death. We can align ourselves with the truth. And we have much to lose if we don't join the fight. So as we consider a deeper form of discipleship 2021... We want to remember these truths. We cannot lose. Our faith and our confidence is what the Lord has done. He is always faithful. He has delivered us. Maybe not from the bear or the lion, and lion in the physical sense, but He has delivered us from incredible things in our lives. We can trust Him and we can move by faith just like the young David. It'll make enemies. We'll make enemies. But the victory is ours. And there's much to lose if we don't join the fight. I'm going to invite you to join the fight. I had somebody text me this week, say, I want to join the fight. Tell me how. Where do I sign up? So we're going to find them some one-on-one -on -one discipleship time that they can begin to grow, grow in confidence, get some equipping and training that they might be confident in the victory that's just waiting for them. You can also know that if you've yet to join the fight, if you've even yet to join the team, you're not even on Jesus' side yet, you can make that decision today. We offer a time of invitation. Mike and his team will come, um, and they'll sing a song. So uh, we'll give you an opportunity. You walk right in here and just come up to me. And if, if, I, if somebody's already visiting with me, Ben's right here. He'll, he'll chat with you. And somebody's visiting with, with Ben and Mark Ashley and Teresa are back there. They'll come and visit with you. And you can say, I want to be on the team. I want to join the team that can't lose. And we'll talk through what it means to put your faith in Jesus. If you have other decisions or prayer needs, you can walk down and see me. We'll take care of those things today.
Would you pray with me as the team gets ready to lead us in a final song? Heavenly Father, God, your name above all names, your place beyond anything we can imagine, yet you reveal yourself through your word, through your church, God, through your Holy Spirit in the lives of believers. God, we're thankful for what you're doing in our community with this congregation and congregations across Artesia and across our state, our nation, and the world as your church moves forward with the great confidence, the victory that is ours. Continue to convict and move in our hearts and minds that we might find victory because of Jesus, because of what he has done. And God, if we are uh, hesitant, uh, just encourage us and strengthen us. I ask blessing over this congregation as we conclude our time this morning. And God, if there are decisions to be made that people will faithfully do that, that they'll just have boldness uh, to step forward and to accept whatever it is your will for their lives. This is our prayer this morning in Christ's name. Amen. Please stand and please respond. This is my desire.